come to thee and ask thee thy prayer this day, that thou will put in our hearts the memory of those brave souls who have been willing to fight and stand for this nation, to defend freedom, <coughs> and to give us the wonderful land and the inheritance we have. Let us be not only proud, but let us make our lives that which would count worthy of all that they have done. We ask all of this in thy precious and holy name, in the name of Jesus. Place the memorial wreaths. Present oh. I want to thank everyone for coming out today to remember our loved ones who have passed on. We all have family members whose memories we cherish and who help make us the persons we are. As we wrestle with life's problems, we often fall back on the things our parents and grandparents told us while we were growing up. They set the examples that we followed and it became a part of our, our character. In like manner, we as veterans remember those who served before us and contemplate what they gave us in the way of liberty. In addition, they provided the knowledge and the spirit of how to defend our freedom from those who would take it away. These memories are indispensable in carrying on the effort to preserve a great and free nation. Our memories and our history provide a trend line for future generations to follow in a continuing effort to improve our country. Because of the sacrifices made by our veterans in defending this country and the freedom we, we enjoy, I always feel it necessary to talk about some aspect of that freedom. This year I would like to talk about the Bill of Rights. I don't know how many of you know that we almost did not have a Bill of Rights. It is so taken for granted now that we probably think of it as something that naturally followed the writing of the Constitution. You may be surprised to know that many of our founding fathers did not want a Bill of Rights attached to the Constitution, and that it was initially approved without a listing of rights. Only after some hot debate and demands by some states on the issue was it promised to add amendments to the Constitution listing the very, our various rights. You're probably wondering why the founding fathers were against the Bill of Rights. Well, there were two reasons and they were legitimate and reasonable arguments. When it comes to a listing of rights, one must consider what are the rights we possess. It is not an easy assignment to come up with a complete list, and this is what the founders feared. If they failed to list all of our rights and forgot to include one or two or three, what would be the status of those rights they forgot to list? Could the government assume that because they were not listed, they did not exist? Consider the right of privacy which many of us assume we possess. It wasn't listed in the Bill of Rights, and it wasn't until the Supreme Court said it was a right in the 20th century that it came into legal existence. The court had to play some word games even then to establish a right to privacy. What about a right to travel, to move about? Those aren't listed, but we all probably assume we have those rights. When you make a listing of rights, it is incomplete you leave unlisted rights in a state of limbo. Later, it can be very difficult to establish a right that was left out. That is one reason that some were against a listing of rights. The second reason the founders were against a listing of rights concerns the basic structure of the Constitution. We must first consider that people have rights while governments have powers. Under the Constitution, the federal government 
was given a, given a short listing of powers and it was assumed it would stay within the bounds of those powers. For instance, the federal government was given the power to establish an army and a navy. It was not, however, given any power to interfere with our religion, our speech, our press, our right to bear arms, our right to a fair trial, and so on. If the government has been given no power to interfere with our right of free speech, why do we need to list free speech as one of our rights? Remember, they were trying to keep the Constitution as concise as possible. James Madison, the father of the Constitution, was one who was initially against a listing of rights. He had to be convinced that it was necessary and eventually came around to the side favoring a Bill of Rights as did others. Although this episode in the approval of our Bill of Rights is not much more than a footnote in our history books, I believe that it is important that people know and understand the thinking of our founders. We should also, we should consider ourselves lucky that there were those who stood up for a Bill of Rights because the second argument I presented turned out to be faulty. The assumption that our rights would be protected because the federal government was not given the power to abuse our rights has proved to be very short-sighted. The list of enumerated powers given to Congress in Article 1, Section 8 is very short and is without doubt the most violated part of our Constitution. Many, and I would suggest most, of the laws passed by Congress in the last few decades contain powers that are not listed in the enumerated powers section of the Constitution. I would suggest that everyone read this section of the Constitution and try to find justification for many of the things the federal government does. Only by making words into rubber yardsticks can many of our federal laws be justified. Congress used to write laws that would state the provision of the Constitution that authorized that particular law. Then as Congress began passing laws of doubt, doubtful constitutionality, it still made reference to enumerated powers, however slim the connection might be. Finally, Congress has now given up any pretense of trying to justify what it enacts with the powers given it in the Constitution. Many in Congress now assume that it has the power to do just about anything it wishes. Rarely has the Supreme Court knocked down a law for not being enumerated in the Constitution. Only the Bill of Rights now protects our rights from being totally trampled on by the, by the federal government. But I can assure you that our rights are being threatened. With the possible exception of the Third Amendment prohibiting the government from housing soldiers in your houses, I can show you where the rest of our rights have been eroded to some extent. If we do not take a firm stand against government encroachment, our freedoms are going to disappear. Every new law and regulation takes away decisions we could have made ourselves. They either mandate we do something or mandate we not do something. Our unending torrent of laws out of Washington has put us on a slippery slope to authoritarianism, where government controls everything we do. Before it's too late, we must consider Kathy Young's thought, where on the slippery slope do we stop? I fear that we are losing even the most basic understanding of our liberty. For me, I would define liberty as that state of affairs in which I make my own decisions about my own life. Authoritarianism and tyranny are the conditions under which I would be denied the right to make my own decisions. In tyrannical countries, the state itself reserves the right to make decisions for the people. It does this through laws, regulations, rules, directives, taxes, subsidies, and social programs. And do not be mistaken, democracies in the past have been, become tyrannical. Let me finish with these words by Charlie Reese. Truly freedom is the capacity to make decisions in the absence of coercion. Since every law by its nature, and regardless of its subject, commands us to do something or not do something, it follows like a river down a hill that freedom is diminished law by law, regulation by regulation, for each one eliminates a decision we could have made ourselves. Thank you. Rick. Flag squad, port, fire! 
Ready. Aim. Fire. 